as the universities became more liberal, the news media followed that pattern. And that's why you end up uh, with the kind of news media that we have today. Although the intensity as it relates to Trump, I think, is different. Um, how, how, and this, I'll, I'll include the, the, uh, the, the post-student group also in this. How, <clears throat> how, how many of you on election day in 2016 uh, thought Hillary would probably win? Just raise your hand. Okay. Now, this is a conservative audience, and yet 90% of the hands went up. How, how many of you were confident Trump would win? One, okay, two, like about three of you. So, so I'm going to start, and this is part of why I wrote Trump's America, because I'd, I'd written last year a book called Understanding Trump, which um, really was because he's so different that there were all sorts of people coming up to me saying, you know, I, I don't understand what he's doing. I don't understand how he does it. And so that book really focused on Trump. And I think it, had, frankly, uh, weathered pretty well over the last year. I think if you read it now, it still has, it's, it's very relevant because he's, the large parts of who he is haven't changed. But I realized as I watched what was going on that a great deal of what we're living through isn't Trump as a personality, but it's things that are happening in America. And that you have to look at the larger picture of the, of the America that Trump is president of in order to fully understand the Trump presidency. And that, that's why Trump's America is different. And I have a theory about why the left is so hostile. And it goes back to Election Day. Think about all of your friends who are liberals, who about 8 o'clock on election evening were about to pop the champagne. Hillary was going to break the glass ceiling. They were going to get a left-wing Supreme Court justice. Uh, they were going to have policies on the left. They were going to have weakness overseas. They were going to raise taxes. You know, life was good. And two hours later, and some of you may have lived through this, may have seen it in, 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 in whatever room you were in that night. Two hours later, they're suddenly staring at each other, beginning to realize that not only is she not going to be president, but that means that Donald J. Trump is going to be president. And I believe what happened was a traumatic event comparable to a psychosis. That the intensity and speed of the change was so great that most liberals today suffer from a political variance of PTSD. <laughs> and that, that part of Trump's genius is... He tweets every morning. And so these people who go to bed and, and they, they, they spend the night trying not to think of the nightmare that is occurring, and they wake up in the morning, and they're about to begin a happy new day, and they see a Trump tweet, and they suddenly realize, oh, my God, he's still president. <laughs> and so they, they, can't, they can't get over it. It's like watching Groundhog Day as a political film. Uh, <laughs> And they just come back to it again and again and again. And that's a big part of why you have this, this extraordinary level of anger. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to say we're political opponents or we're ideological opponents. But there is a deep personal part of this. And it's because, you know, he, almost like in the Middle Ages, he's a guy who usurped the kingship. I mean, you have a usurper now sitting in the White House who does, shouldn't, liter shouldn't be there legitimately. Well, Trump, of course, basically ignores all that. Uh, and, and what people don't really appreciate about him is Trump grew up in the New York media market, which is the toughest, nastiest, most competitive media market in the country. And Trump learned by 1985 or so that if he was willing to fight, he would get coverage every day. And Trump likes coverage. So he has spent the last 33 years fighting. And when people say, oh, is he going to get worn out? No. He wakes up in the morning looking for a fight. He enjoys it. He gains energy from it. And so that's part of why you have this noise level up here. But, but under the noise level, there are huge things happening. I mean, a couple examples that are obvious. We now have the lowest black unemployment rate in American history. Now, you'd think liberals would be thrilled because, after all, this means that, that in, a, in a group who they express deep concern for, there are now more job opportunities than ever. In fact, two days ago, there was a report that came out that said there are now more vacancies than there are people looking for work. Now, you would think that's good. Um, the Federal Reserve in Atlanta estimates 
that this quarter the economy is going to grow at 4.8 percent. If that happens, that's not only more than twice as fast as ever under Obama, but that begins to move back into the Reagan range of having a boom. And part of what that's signaling, I talked last night to Steve Miller at the Heritage Foundation, is a very, very good professional economist, who said the size of the investment structure that's coming down the road, the number of companies that are now investing is stunning. I was with a, a Canadian firm two weeks ago, and they said virtually every company in Canada is looking at moving people to the United States because the new tax code makes us the most competitive country in the world. So you're better off tax-wise to be here than anywhere else in the world, which is an enormous shift, which means you're going to see a huge amount of money coming into the U.S. to build factories and create jobs and found companies. At the same time, you have the deregulation process. The Trump team have deregulated, cut red tape, more than all the other presidents since World War II combined. And what does that do? Well, it liberates businesses to invest. Well, the, you actually were seeing the economy start to take off before the tax cuts because the deregulation process was sending signals that said you ought to go out and, and increase your business, hire more people, do more things. Government's not going to harass you and, 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 uh, and try to put you out of business. And so they're already starting down the road that's changing. But it's not, notice the book's not called Trump's government, it's called Trump's America. And the reason for that is there are very interesting things happening outside of government that are actually going to compel dramatic change in government. Now, my favorite, we have a whole chapter on uh, space because I really have, I'm passionate about space. I think it's, it is, in fact, I think our future. I mean, I'm curious, how many of you would be interested if there was a, an opportunity uh, to go into space? How many of you would actually be willing to do it? Just raise your hand. I'm just curious. There's a... You know, the, the, the people talk about risk. We lose 15 people a year at Yosemite because they go hiking on these various trails. And There are, I think, 200 people now on Mount Everest who are frozen that they can't get off uh, because you climb Mount Everest, it's dangerous. And yet every year, people show up. Lots of people show up at Yosemite, but people also show up at Everest. So what you have is that we're right at the opening stages of moving from space as a very rare thing done by a very small number of very specialized people to space as a zone of pioneering and colonization. And again, a large part of it is not, and this is where Trump as an entrepreneur fits in, but it's not government per se. Uh, there's a book called Space Barons I recommend to all of you, right after, of course, you finish reading Trump's America. Uh, but Space Barons is fascinating because it takes four billionaires. And, and we've really not adjusted yet to the fact that there are people on this planet who are wealthy enough that they're the equivalent of a country, that they have that many assets. So in a way, the most ephemeral of space barons is Richard Branson, uh, who runs Virgin America, ran Virgin America, which has now been sold, but Virgin Atlantic and others. Uh, he has a firm called Virgin Galactic. They've now, they have a spaceship too, uh, and it's now successfully completed two flights. And it is designed to take six passengers and a uh, pilot and co-pilot up to about 60 miles, which is right at, literally at the edge of space. So you would, you would ride up in it, and you'd have about 15 minutes of being weightless and taking pictures of the Earth as seen from 60 miles up. Um, and he's put a fair amount of money into this thing. He has hundreds of people who have put down $250,000 uh, to reserve a seat on one of his flights. Uh, the second person who's doing this is Paul Allen. Now, Paul Allen was the co-founder of Microsoft. He's worth about $46 billion. Uh, and Allen decided to go a totally different route. Uh, he is building a, the largest airplane in the world, basically two 747s that are, that are joined together at the middle. And it's designed to carry a rocket up to about 50,000 feet and then launch it. And his goal is to make going into space about the same convenience as getting on a domestic airliner. So you literally would call ahead and say, gee, I'd like to go up Thursday at 2 o'clock, and you just go do it. And, and you wouldn't have to go through training, and you wouldn't go you know, down to, to, to Houston. And so, again, that, that's a near space example. 
The third example is Elon Musk, who is a South African who's become an American, uh, who invented Tesla. He's done all sorts of things. Uh, and uh, one of his projects is called SpaceX. And SpaceX, and, and he says openly, publicly, his goal is to colonize Mars, um, which, again, is very different from the NASA model. The NASA model is to have a handful of astronauts who are exquisitely trained go visit Mars for a little bit. Uh, he's talking about lots of people like us just showing up one morning as pioneers. So he's, and he figured out early on that the biggest single problem with getting to space was cost. And the biggest problem with cost was simple. You use rockets once. Well, imagine if every time you took off in an airplane, it was the only flight that airplane would make, how expensive commercial flying would be. Because, of course, you reduce cost radically the more often you use it. So he has been designing his rockets so that they will take off and then return. And some of you may have seen the YouTube video of the two rockets that look like a ballet. That They come back down parallel to each other and land. And his goal is to have every rocket used at least 10 times. Well, he will take at least 40% out of the cost of getting into space. And so suddenly, you have a different cost structure. You can do different things. You have different opportunities. But the person who is the real example of the Wright brothers and Henry Ford uh, is Jeff Bezos. Bezos has been a space fanatic since he was about 12 years old. He got rich for the purpose of going into space. Uh, Amazon worked probably better than expected it would. Uh, he's now the wealthiest man in the world, at least for the present. So I, I, I sat with Bezos a couple months ago. He writes a personal check for a billion dollars every year. And no federal hearings, no government regulations, no congressional investigations, just he hires engineers. No long-term planning, none, none of the NASA bureaucracy. He just hires engineers. By either next year or the year after, they will have a rocket called the John Glenn, which is a heavy lift rocket, which is reusable, which will literally put 5,500 pounds into space. And then the rocket will come back down, get refueled, take another 5,500 pounds into space. And their goal is to be able to do it every day. That is, one, one flight per day per rocket. Uh, this is a revolution in capabilities. And it's, the reason I use this example is it's happening around the government, not because of the government. I mean, NASA provides certain facilities. NASA's had a long track record and has a big institutional memory. But the truth is, these four entrepreneurs are just doing it. They're not asking permission. They're not sitting around for long planning sessions. Uh, they have varying levels of government support. Musk has gotten the most government support. But <clears throat> excuse me, this is what you see happening everywhere. There's a, there's a firm you can look up called Udacity. It's, a, it's Audacity without the A. Udacity is an online learning system that was invented by the guy Sebastian Thrun, <coughs> forgive me, who uh, invented uh, the Google self-driving car and invented Google's uh, EarthView and taught at Stanford and offered a course on advanced computing and offered it online. And he had 400 students uh, who were registered at Stanford and 53,000 people who signed up online, which frankly made the Stanford faculty pretty mad because they weren't paying tuition. Uh, of the a considerable number of them finished the course. When he did the final, the top Stanford student was number 400 in the final exam. There were 399 other people online who did better. And he said he had this very sobering realization that as much as he liked his lectures, they weren't the most effective way to learn. That the most effective way was to actually have a relationship where you could ask the computer over and over if you didn't get it, because the computer never got bored. It's very, very hard. I don't know how many of you ever tried this? It's very hard to ask a professor three, four, five times the same question, because you just you, you get intimidated by yourself. And even if the professor's willing to, you're not willing to. But the computer doesn't care. And so he thought this. He wanted to go out and experiment with it. So he he built Udacity, uh, which is an online learning system and promptly found that the University of California faculty hated it because it was a threat. 
I mean, yeah, we, I once wrote a book, the, the subtitle was Pioneers of the Future and Prison Guards of the Past. Because you have to remember, every one of these things, it's like the Transcontinental Railroad versus the stagecoach. I mean, whoever was the last cycle doesn't get all that excited when the next cycle starts to make them obsolete. So he had the courage when, when they literally said you could not offer his material in the University of California system. And so he said, fine, I'm not even going to try to get accredited. And he started signing contracts with places like Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook. That if you take his courses and you pass them for the purpose of hiring you, they're certified by those companies. And he's discovered that there's an amazing number of people who say, let me get this straight. I can get a normal degree or I can get a degree that Google recognizes for the purpose of hiring me. I think I'll try that. And so, again, it's an example of the beginning of the future. Of, of a, because if we're going to go through artificial intelligence and we're going to go through robotics, uh, we're going to have so many jobs where people need to be re-educated that we need to think of new and creative and better ways of learning so people can continuously upgrade their marketable skills. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. Uh, Heather, there is, there are some early indications that uh, over the short tenure of President Trump, we've seen a marked decrease in the number of unauthorized entries into the United States. Uh, are there any lessons we can take away from that? Yes, law enforcement works. The rule of law matters. Uh, you send signals for better or for worse. You send a signal when you're not enforcing the law that we allow our immigration policy to be determined by people outside of the country in their decisions to come in. And when you announce that, in fact, you are going to take the rule of law seriously, people respond. This is a message we learned in New York City with policing that should be understood by every police chief today uh, that whether you decide to enforce the law or not, you do change behavior. And certainly one of the greatest travesties that we're experiencing today and that I applaud President Trump for focusing on so relentlessly is the sanctuary city movement, uh, where you have big city police chiefs who should know better, betraying everything they understand about lawbreaking in order to coddle the illegal immigration lobby. And so they are saying it doesn't matter that an illegal alien has committed a low-level crime. Uh, we are going to prevent ICE from even making an inquiry about that illegal alien criminal. That is a constitutional violation of the highest order for the locals to defy federal authority this way. Uh, but it also undermines the public order, the, the sense of cities being in control that big city police chiefs otherwise understand. Uh, Christy, tell me about your uh, sense about the recent change in priorities vis-a-vis uh, -vis immigration enforcement. Uh, do you have a sanguine view as Heather, or do you see things differently? I see things slightly differently. Certainly, um, enforcement is a huge part of immigration reform. It absolutely has to be. But you also have to consider why people want to come to the United States and address those issues. We are constantly going to see people wanting to violate our sovereign borders to come here to work. If we can better change our guest worker programs and some of the other reasons that people try to violate our border sovereignty, we can focus more on collecting the criminals that are hiding in our cities, making sure that you know, there's not drug, drug traffickers running across the border, but that has to work hand in hand. Uh, one, f and, and Mark, I do want you to respond too, but, uh, but I have another follow-up question for Christy. This is a mm -hmm. little bit unrelated, but uh, there is a group of Mexican uh, former senior government officials and lawmakers, the Monarca Group, uh, which has explicitly talked about coordinating with unauthorized Mexican migrants in the United States and encouraging them to uh, 
essentially uh, try to defy uh, deportation orders and what have you, uh, giving them various uh, you know, kinds of guidance uh, so as to help them mm -hmm. uh, work around uh, U.S. immigration enforcement. I wonder, do you believe that these efforts aid the cause of advocates of increased legal immigration, or do you think that they hinder it? I think anything that violates the rule of law is a hindrance. Um, you know, whether or not that law needs to be changed is a separate discussion, but we should not be advocating for anyone to violate the law as it stands. Mark, you wanted to follow well, up? Yeah, I wanted to respond to Christie's first point that in effect, and I'm simplifying it here, but in effect, we need to let the people who want to come in in that way legally, that way they won't come in illegally. And the fact is there's no practical limit to the number of people who would want to come to the United States. Obviously, in the first year, it wouldn't be 10 million people, but over time, you know, there really, I mean, there are hundreds of millions of people abroad who would move here if they could, and it's not just dependent on labor market demand, because, frankly, living on the street in the United States beats living in a hut in much of the world. So that my, my point here is that we can never meet the demand for immigration to the United States simply by increasing the numbers and thereby eliminating illegal immigration. It just doesn't, it can't work that way. We're going to have to have limits and we're going to have to enforce those limits. I completely agree. Um, we do need to have limits and we will probably never meet the demand of all of the people that want to enter the United States. 100% agree. But that's where lawmakers come in to make sure that the limits that we have in place make sense for the United States and for humanitarian reasons abroad as well, um, and that uh, we set you know smart limits on these policies so that you know we can set you know an amount of people to come in that makes sense rather than sort of coming up with these arbitrary numbers that haven't really served any purpose in the past. Uh, Heather, just to just to pick up on this theme, uh, I wonder, uh, isn't it fair to say that what might make sense for, for example, low-wage employers might be different from what makes sense from the perspective of taxpayers who are concerned about uh, safety net benefits and what have you? Well, if you want to see the future of the country, if we retain the immigration status quo now, I invite you to go to my home state of California because it is on the vanguard <clears throat> of the radical demographic change that has occurred thanks to what is virtually an open borders policy that favors mass, low-skilled immigration. California used to be the leader in education from K to 12. That we were, in the 50s and 60s, California led the nation in the quality of, of high school graduates. Today, it resembles a southern backwater like Mississippi, Alabama, or Arkansas, with all due respect to those wonderful <laughs> states, but they're not necessarily at the top of the educational heap. A third of all, his, of all California eighth graders lack the most rudimentary uh, math and reading skills. California spends endless amounts of redistribution of tax dollars to try and close the achievement gap between Hispanic and white students, and it has not budged since 1990. Hispanics are massive users of public health care, government health care, and accordingly, the biggest supporter. They were the biggest supporters of Obamacare. So the usual discourse about uh, that you hear from the more of the pro-immigration open borders lobby is that there's a benefit, an economic benefit to all types of immigration, fails to note the difference between high skilled and low skilled, and fails to take account inevitably of the taxpayer costs of supporting efforts at, at the education level, criminal justice costs, we are creating a second underclass. The incarceration rate of Mexican Americans jumps eightfold between the first and second generation to equal that of blacks, uh, and it ignores the, the health care costs. So yes, there is a, a large welfare component to low-skilled immigration that is rarely taken into account. 
We, uh, you mentioned earlier on, Christy, uh, humanitarian immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, and generally speaking, my understanding is that humanitarian immigration is refugee immigration into the United States. Um, and I noticed a striking fact from the Migration Policy Institute. Uh, MPI observed that, in fact, the children of refugee immigrants are somewhat less likely to live in households below the poverty line than non-refugee immigrants. <laughs> and yet, in principle, non-refugee immigrants are meant to be held to the standard that they're supposed to become self-sufficient. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think that there's emerged some kind of imbalance between refugee and non-refugee immigration? Um, you know, I think that you have to consider that, you know, the, the differences, obviously, between refugees and, and every other immigrant category. Um, you know, certainly these people are coming from areas where they may have been in refugee camps for the previous decade. You have to consider that. In many cases, they're children. Exactly. You'd expect school. them to be much, much poorer, which is why I found it right. so surprising that right. non-refugee immigrants appear to be as poor, if not more so, than refugee immigrants. Well, often, you know, the, I think that some of the difference can be explained because refugees often come over with their families, so they have a strong sense of family. They are initially offered a lot of um, resettlement and assimilation services that are very beneficial to them, including English as a second language services. That often aids in their um, ability to kind of work into their community. They have immediate access to safety net yes. programs, whereas other yes. lawful immigrants they do have not. a waiting they period are banned for five, for five years, years. For, for, most, uh, for most visas. Um, and then, you, you know, you often see that once their children are going to school, they can aid in their family, you know, learning, learning English, kind of navigating the U.S. healthcare system, which is obviously very complex. Um, and, you know, they, they tend to do very well. They've re-energized a lot of cities in the United States. So, Mark, just to, just to be clear about this, I mean, you know, again, um, so I guess in principle, in law, and correct me if I'm wrong here, there is a distinction between refugee immigrants. We assume that they are helpless. We assume that they require humanitarian assistance. And non-refugee immigrants, and yet non-refugee immigrants appear to be heavily reliant on the safety net. Can but, you tell us yeah, a little yeah, bit because, about that? See, the, what you're, what, I mean, not to get too much into the weeds here, but what they're finding is the adult children of refugees are not the children of the refugees we're getting now. They're the children of Cubans, Vietnamese, and Russian Jews. In other words, part of this is a function of where the refugees came from and their level of education when they got here. So we're looking at the children of an earlier wave of refugees and today's refugees are dramatically different in their human capital, their education, and what I just want to focus a little you. bit in on what we know about safety net reliance for non-refugee immigrants, because you know there is a five-year uh, limit, uh, yet most uh, lawful immigrants in the country have been in the country for longer than five right. years. Yeah, uh, we actually looked at the census survey that does the best job at getting at use of welfare, and what we found was that among Far, Welfare understood broadly, broadly not just the all, TANF yeah, all, any, any means-tested program, not Social Security, which is not means-tested, but food stamps, Medicaid, TANF, et cetera. And what we found was that about half of all families headed by immigrants, <laughs> legal or illegal, are using at least one welfare program. Basically, what it boils down to is that less skilled immigrants cannot earn enough to feed their own children in the United States. And this is a pretty basic... Um, a basic fact that has to be taken into account when making immigration policy decisions. I mean, as Heather was talking about, what we are doing, or what we have been doing now for decades, is privatizing the benefits of low-skilled immigration that uh, restaurants and landscapers and other people use by keeping their wage costs down, and then socializing the cost on everybody else. This is why the National Academy of Sciences just last year did this magisterial study on immigration. And what they found was that net immigration has a small positive effect on the economy, but that small positive effect has two important caveats. One is it comes from taking wealth from the poor and giving it to everybody else because the people who compete with immigrants are worse off. Everybody else is slightly better off. And the, the second point is that that small economic benefit is totally wiped out by the extra social service costs. Well, I have costs. a question first for Heather and then for Christie, I hope. Uh, there, is, there was for a very long time a consensus among libertarian-minded thinkers, and now that's being challenged in lots of interesting and, and, and useful ways, uh, but a consensus that large-scale, less-skilled immigration would be just fine if we did not have a safety net, an extensive safety net, period. 
Uh, although it, it occurs to me that in the recent debate over Obamacare, a program that is in fact quite young, that's only been on the books for a very short amount of time, that it's actually very difficult to reverse this recent and quite modest extension of the social safety net. Do you believe it's plausible that we are going to dismantle the larger social safety net in the United States uh, in the near future? Uh, I, don't, I don't think that the ACLU and the La Raza are going to go away in the near future. And uh, so they are going to be pressing the notion that everybody is entitled to government support. So I don't think it's likely. But even so, if we, if we carry out that thought experiment and say that the importation of poverty, of multi-generational poverty, uh, that is occurring with mass low-skilled immigration is not met with government programs, I'm still not certain that it's a net benefit because you still have people who are not advancing, that are not necessarily adding uh, to the nation's ability to compete. Social capital matters. Culture matters. Uh, and the usual trick is when people are talking about more immigration is to invoke Sergey Brin. And obviously, he's an immigrant that we were right to bring in. His parents came. They were PhDs in mathematics from Russia. It's pretty predictable uh, that he is going to be a major contributor to American innovation and competitiveness. But the endless importation of people with, as, Mac, as, as uh, Mark says, eighth grade or third grade education and a culture that reflects their own countries is not necessarily the way to go, regardless of whether they're uh, using welfare programs or not. No. say is you cannot reform socialism. You know, reforming socialism and making it work this time is kind of like saying, well, you know, I'm highly allergic to poison ivy, and, but here's what I'm going to do. And there's a lot of it in my yard. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a pair of scissors and you know, poison ivy has three leaves on it. And I'm going to go all through the yard. And I'm, going to, I'm going to clip off one leaf of every poison ivy plant. I'm going to, I'm going to reform poison ivy. And so that'll, that'll do the trick. Or, or if you live in Alabama and you have kudzu that's taken over your, your pine tree, it's kind of like saying, well, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to get some scissors and clip around the edges of some of these kudzu leaves. It'll stop it from growing. It won't, well, the problem solved. And of course, you cannot reform socialism uh, despite what George Stig Stiglitz says. You know, George Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winning leftist uh, communist economist, uh, uh, when he was working for Bill Clinton, uh, authored an article in the New York Times claiming socialism can work after all. You just need to have smart guys like me in charge. And of course, <clears throat> how many times has that argument been made over the past 100, 100 or so years, over and over and over and over and over again? You know, what, uh, you know, what a hubris you know, can you have? It, it shows you that you don't need to know anything about economics, really, to win the Nobel Prize in economics. And, uh, and it reminded me of when a, a speech my old professor Gordon Tulloch once made at a, at a meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society in, in Cambridge, England. And this was back in 1984 when I was only two years old that time, back then. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Gordon brought down the house. These were all these, uh, you know, Hayek was there. You know, these were all these classical liberals. And, he, uh, and uh, he's, he's giving the speech how to win the Nobel Prize. And all he had was a bunch of quotations from James Tobin. And he would just you know, read one of these things and the whole 700 people would just break out in laughter and, uh, over and over again. And, but, but these were people who, who were familiar with Austrian economics or at least the bastard child of Austrian economics, Chicago School economics, <laughs> at least they knew, 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 knew that. And so, so they, they got it, they got his jokes. So you cannot re reform socialism because of the incentive problem, the old incentive problem, the calculation problem that uh, you all should be schooled in by now in this room, and, the, and the, the knowledge problem, the idea that a small group of planners could somehow possess all the knowledge that is in the minds of the millions of market participants
uh, you know, in other words, the eye pencil, the famous essay eye pencil by Leonard Reed, you know, read that and you understand that what the knowledge problem is basically of organizing uh, the allocation of resources takes a lot of information of time and place in the minds of a lot of different people. And so you can't reform socialism for these uh, reasons. And, uh, you know, when I teach principles of economics, you know, week one, week two, at some point, uh, I tell the class, here's, uh, or sometimes the first day of class, uh, what, when we're going to, here's how I'm going to grade everybody. I'm gonna, we're going to give uh, multiple choice exams here. It's principles of microeconomics. And uh, I'm going to get all the exams. And, if, and uh, all I'm going to do is I'm going to get the higher scores and I'm going to redistribute the points. So if you got 100, I'll probably give 20 or 30 points away to the guy who got a 40 so that everybody gets a C, the same grade, because I'm going to adopt academic socialism. That's, that's what we're going to do. And so you've, got, so you've got that problem. And so, of course, every single one of them understands, well, why should I study? Why should I spend one minute studying? Uh, I'm going to get a C no matter what happens. And, uh, and so and that's that's the incentive problem. But the, mo the more important problem, though, is the calculation problem. Uh, how do you know how to how to uh, put resources together in an efficient manner to produce goods and services if there are no private property and, and market prices, if the prices are arbitrarily dictated by government and they don't reflect uh, scarcity or supply and demand in general, then you're just uh, doing everything random. It's like. It's like trying to drive around a strange city without street signs and find where you're going. It's, it's an impossibility. Okay. Uh, point number four I would make is that uh, democratic socialism, uh, there's no reason why democratic socialism cannot be just as destructive as any other kind of socialism. Uh, uh, Bastiat, Friedrich Bastiat wrote in his famous book, little book, The Law, that in, in his day he recognized that well, what's the difference between the government just confiscating factories and people voting to allow government to confiscate the factories? <laughs> the, only, the only difference is, well, we took a vote on it. But the end result is the government confiscated the factories. And so he made the point that, you know, if the government votes to have some one uniform plan, or the people vote to have one uniform plan put on all of society, it's the same as communism. If communism would just put one uniform plan on society by the government, it doesn't really matter whether you took a vote on it or not. You get the same, you get the same result. And of course, if you just look around the world, you look at Venezuela today. I probably we're going to have, and I encourage everybody to listen to the presentation by our students from Venezuela tomorrow. What, what time is it tomorrow? What is it? Twelve thirty. Twelve thirty tomorrow about the Venezuelan economy. Because your, your classmate with the Capitalism Must Die t-shirt needs to know about what's going on in Venezuela uh, today. And it has been going on for quite a while. Brazil, Argentina, the same thing. These are all democratic countries. Hitler was elected. You know, dem democracy doesn't necessarily uh, guarantee uh, peace and prosperity at all. Uh, and as far as that, you know, what, one of the, one of the uh, questions I always get when I, when I did radio interviews about this is uh, what about Sweden? You know, what about Sweden? Some of the Scandinavian countries. Well, you know, uh, one of the things I did in my classroom last year when I was talking about this is there are these indexes of economic freedom, and uh, the Heritage Foundation does one, Cato Institute does one, the Fraser Institute in Canada uh, does one, and and, uh, and actually Walter Block is is sort of the founding father of these indexes of economic freedom. He, he uh, worked with the Liberty Fund, geez, it was like the late 80s, early 90s, and to start have some conferences that just start talking about this concept of uh, indexes of economic freedom. And I attended one of the very first ones that Walter organized, and I sat next to Milton and Rose Friedman, and uh, uh, Richard Stroop was there, and Charles Murray, and, uh, who's a, a, a fabulous statistician, and, and people like that, and just talking about the concept of, well, what should we include in these indexes of economic freedom? But now they're, they're very well worked out. There's, there's scholarly articles that, that have been written about them in all the top economics journals. And if you look at the latest rankings, they rank countries, and they give them a number by uh, you know, the degree of economic freedom, you know, freedom, freedom of exchange, free trade, uh, 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 for, foreign exchange rate, controls by government, sanct you know, protection of property rights, all these categories that they use. And Sweden and the United States are pretty much tied today. 
you know, the rank, it's like like 116 and 117 is the index number for, for these countries. So, so the degree of economic freedom, in other words, in Sweden is about today, about the same as in the United States. It wasn't always that way, though. Uh, Sweden, you know, after, in the post-World War II years, uh, adopted their version of, uh, of, of democratic socialism. And among the things, and so, and they were able to do that because uh, Sweden was a very low-tax, uh, uh, high, uh, high economic freedom country in the late 19th, early 20th century. They produced many great entrepreneurs who, uh, you know, the, the Saab automobiles and, and, and things like that, uh, dynamite, you know, Alfred Nobel and dynamite. And, and, the, and so it became very prosperous, one of the wealthiest countries uh, in Europe, certainly, and if not the world, for a while. And then they made this big U-turn and adopted uh, post-war socialism and uh, according to the Swedish Academy of Economics, and I guess it's their version of the American Economic Association, not a single net new job was created in Sweden from 1950 until 2005. Not one net new job was created. 55 years of zero job growth in Sweden as a result of Swedish socialism. And so by the 1980s, they did what Venezuela is doing today. They did what they do, Argentina did in the 80s. They tried to inflate their way out of it. They created a lot of inflation and 500% interest rates in Sweden in the 1980s. And so that caused a great retrenchment. So they've still been retrenching, uh, cutting back, cutting taxes, uh, uh, even doing away with some uh, uh, socialized medicine, privatizing industries, so that today they're back, their ranking, their economic freedom index ranking is uh, much closer to the U.S. You know, as you know, we've been marching in their direct, their direct, we've been marching in that direction. So what I told, what I told some of my students was that when Bernie Sanders makes speeches say we should be more like Sweden, he means Sweden of 1970, the Sweden of his youth. He doesn't, he doesn't mean Sweden today. And, and the government of Sweden adamantly uh, denies that they're a socialist country. You know, who wants to be called a socialist country aside from the crazy people in Venezuela and Cuba and, and, and a few other places like that in the government uh, today? You know, you know, invest here. We are a socialist country. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For example, um, if we were to say, look, the, the shoe industry is just out of control. We need the government to control all production of shoes. We need to socialize shoes. Most economists would be very opposed. Uh, and they would argue that um, if the government controls the production of shoes, it will end in disaster. And, and they would be right. Um, they would point out all kinds of problems which would emerge if we socialized the shoe industry. But when it comes to money, economists just forget that all these problems of socialist planning exist. Uh, economists don't, they don't even think twice about this problem. It's just assumed that money is so different uh, that government, and especially a central bank, has to control it. Uh, now, some economists would also say, they would, might respond by saying, look, it's exactly because money is so important that we can't let the market handle it. Uh, we can't let you know, private interests control this thing that's so vital. But if you think about the, the logic behind this, it's, it's actually sort of crazy. Because the argument really boils down to, to saying something like this. Money is so important, it's so vital, that we need to centrally plan it. It's so important that we have to control it using the methods of the most disastrous system in, in history, the most disastrous economic system in history. Um, my, uh, but the, the overall point that I want to make is that you can have a, a government authority controlling the production, just as you can have a, a government uh, authority controlling the production of iPads, you can have a government controlling the business of money production as well. And for a long time now, this has uh, been done through what we call central banks. Uh, basically, a, a central bank comes in, the, the way central banks come into existence is that government selects one bank or a group of banks to be the leading banks in the economy, uh, and it gives them uh, special privileges to separate them from the competition. Uh, and then those banks uh, try to steer the economy of the country in various ways. Uh, in the US, the central bank is the Federal Reserve System, uh, with its chairman, uh, Ben Bernanke. Uh, 
Uh, now, because the, uh, the central bank is a bank, uh, the way they try to manage the economy is through controlling all the different aspects of money. Uh, so the Fed, for example, can uh, increase the supply of money in the economy, uh, and it can set certain interest rates higher or lower if it wants to encourage people to save or spend, um, and it can encourage other banks to lend uh, in various ways as well. Uh, but the result of this kind of policy is that the central bank manages the money of the country uh, in a very top-down fashion, and through managing its money, it manages much of the economy in general. And the Fed is the only entity that can do this. Uh, it has, the, the central bank has effectively no competition. Uh, and that is what we might say that money production in the US is socialized. There are no markets and, and no competition in these highest levels of money production. Uh, now, as, as important as it is to, to criticize the Fed, it's, it's just as important to, to make sure that we do it for the right reasons. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is because there are some so, so faulty ideas about what the Fed does that are floating around out there uh, that lead to some, um, some mistaken criticisms. Uh, one of these is that some people might try to tell you that the Federal Reserve, the central bank, is a private bank um, because the, the different banks that uh, comprise the Fed are nominally private or quasi-private technically. Um, and so some critics will complain that uh, the central bank and the Fed, it, it's evil, but it's evil because it's, it's just another greedy private corporation and it doesn't take the public interest to heart. Uh, and if only we could just make the Fed a, a public institution, we could have a, you know, a good old fashioned democratic monetary system. Um, but this kind of thinking is, is just a, a confusion about how the Fed actually works. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the Fed is a government institution. Uh, for example, the, the chairman of the Fed and the board of governors, they're appointed by the president and they're confirmed by the Senate. Uh, and if you had any other corporation in the economy that had its CEO and board of directors appointed by the government, people would immediately say, oh, look, the, the government just controls that organization. Uh, and, uh, and then people would be effectively right in saying that. Um, and the same thing applies to the Fed system, which is, is not a private organization. Uh, in a way that, that matters for us today. Um, by the way, if the, the president or, uh, were to announce uh, that you know, starting tomorrow the, the CEO of Google uh, is going to be appointed by Congress from now on, uh, people would be pretty outraged. Um, but this comes back to the idea that people think money is so different. Um, because even though it would be a huge concern if, if the government started appointing the executives of all private corporations, and many people would cry socialism, uh, people still believe that money is somehow different enough that the ordinary rules just don't apply to it. We're so used to this idea that government must have control over our money uh, and that government must nationalize or socialize money uh, that nobody really thinks twice about any of this. Uh, yeah, so, so the Fed is not a private organization and it's, mis it's mistaken when uh, when people complain about the Fed as if it was just this, this greedy private corporation that just needs to be made public. As one of our friends, uh, Tom Woods, likes to, to put it, the, the problem with the Fed is not that it's not socialist enough, right? Uh, so, uh, and there's one other claim that's sort of along similar lines that I want to uh, point out as well. Some people also say things like, uh, what we really need to do is just make the Federal Reserve accountable to Congress. Uh, the, the Fed has a lot of independence. There's very little formal oversight over what it does. Um, so people just say, oh, well, look, if we could just you know, allow Congress to sort of oversee things, uh, you know, they could you know, keep things on track. Um, but, but of course, this is also a very bad idea um, because I hope I'm not bursting anybody's bubble, but you don't want to put the control of the money supply of, a of the country in the hands of people whose job it is basically to win friends and influence people. Um, because it, as it turns out, members of Congress don't always have the public interest at heart. Sometimes they do things for, out of their own selfish interest. Um, so that's another uh, sort of mistaken attitude that people take towards, uh, towards central banking. Um, but in, in any case, the, the point being that a lot of uh, people have a mistaken idea that the Fed is somehow not part of the government because in name only, it's sort of not, um, but in practice, it's very much a kind of government agency. <laughs>
Anyway, so what I want to get at with this discussion of central banks and the Federal Reserve in particular um, is that they are a very significant form of partial socialism. Uh, remember, if the government socialized iPads, that would be bad for that industry. Um, but at least there would be some parts of the economy, some other industries, which wouldn't feel the, the full effects of government control. Uh, but money is special in one way uh, that I'll talk about. Uh, because we use money to exchange, uh, money is one side of all the exchanges in the economy. It's connected to everything that's bought and sold. So to socialize money is to have a kind of influence not just over one industry, uh, but in a sense all industries and, and over every single exchange. Uh, so when you put government in charge of the printing press, you unleash all of the terrible aspects of government control and bureaucracy uh, on the most important commodity in the economy. And the results are predictable. Government prints money to, to win friends and influence people. Uh, the purchasing power of money declines. Uh, people become even more uncertain about how to plan for the future. Uh, and of course, when money declines uh, in value, the wealth that people try to, to keep in the form of money declines as well. Uh, and in the worst cases, as, as Danny pointed out, uh, can be just completely wiped out. Reckless money creation um, also uh, encourages all sorts of other uh, undesirable behaviors. It encourages people uh, to become debtors and to borrow far beyond their means. Um, because remember, if you, if you, uh, if you expect that uh, government will continue to print money and that the value of money will decline over time, it's a good idea to borrow money now, because then later on you can pay it back when it's not worth as much, uh, and you effectively gain. Uh, and so the, the borrowers get rewarded while the, the lenders get punished. Uh, and these are just a few of the, the more obvious ways that, that government messes up money management. Um, but also, maybe more significantly, government control over money tends to lead to socialist policies in other areas as well. Uh, as I said before, money is connected to everything. Uh, and therefore, uh, so is the banking industry. Uh, because banks lend the money for things like large investment projects. Uh, so they're very closely connected with the large industries that are, uh, that are trying to invest and grow the economy. And there's this, this is enormous network of borrowing and lending that runs all throughout the economy. Uh, and normally, there's uh, nothing wrong with this because entrepreneurs often need to borrow money to do things like research and development. Um, but the problem arises when you have a central bank, because it ties the decisions of businessmen and bankers to itself uh, instead of to consumers. It has, the central bank has its own goals and motivations, which are not related to uh, providing uh, useful goods and services to people. Uh, big investors uh, end up depending on the big banks, which in turn depend on the central bank, which is the source of a lot of new credit for everyone all along down the line. Uh, so central banks end up tying the interests of, of large corporations to the interests of the banks, and that's one way in which they, they gradually expand government influence in the economy, because everybody is borrowing from the large banks in one way or another. And if you're borrowing money from somebody, you, you know, better be careful to do what they say. Um, also, because uh, they can influence the supply of money and the, the interest rates for borrowing, central banks can, can push people to borrow money, uh, even when it's not really a good idea to. Uh, and thus expand this, this network of dependence. Um, and of course, it's a lot easier for government to, to, to do all this when the, the money it's producing is just uh, pieces of paper or electronic entries in a computer uh, than when it's a, a hard commodity like silver, which you can't really reproduce. Uh, so it's, it's through manipulating the supply of, of money and the supply of credit that central banks, like the Fed, get their hooks in just about everything. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, even very socialist economists realize this. Uh, a long time ago, uh, one Marxist economist even said that uh, if you wanted to socialize the economy of Germany, all you needed to do was take over the six largest banks in Berlin. Uh, of course, for the socialists, this was like a great thing. And they often applauded when banks expanded their power. Uh, and even said, you know, look, isn't it great that central banks are becoming more powerful and more widespread uh, because they're doing all the work for us? We don't need you know, a, a revolution of the workers anymore uh, because the banks already finance everyone in the economy. So all we need to do is control the banks and then we'll control everything else. Uh, and then we'll get our, our socialist utopia.